evening. Well, that was an exciting announcement. Um, I'm Stephanie Cordes, Vice Chair of the Cordes Foundation, an organization founded by my parents, Ron and Marty Cordes, who are committed to accelerating social entrepreneurs and their ideas take flight, as well as elevating the role of young women and girls worldwide, which is why we are proud supporters of the Millennium Campus Network. It's been amazing being around such an amazing group of young and inspiring leaders this weekend. But tonight, I'm humbled to stand here before you and recognize a woman who I look up to not only for her prominent role as Charlotte in Sex and the City, <laughs> but more importantly, as a woman, a mother, a social entrepreneur, a philanthropist, a, a humanitarian, and an overall inspiration to the world. Not only has she won the affection of millions through her TV personality, but she's been able to use her success and media presence to spread awareness to causes that she truly cares about, specifically elephants, plights, and the sale of illegal ivory. Today I had a really genuine conversation with her and was able to see the energy and passion that she devotes towards these initiatives, especially when she was sharing two disturbing facts with me. Every 15 minutes, an elephant dies because of poaching. And the U.S. is the second highest trader of illegal ivory in the world. This needs to stop. As a global ambassador for Oak Fam International and a patron for the Delvin Ch David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, Kristen is dedicated to inspiring change, alleviating poverty, and supporting social justice. It's role models like Kristen that encourage me to support wildlife. In fact, earlier this year, my team and I had the opportunity to visit the same wildlife shelter that she supports in Nairobi, Kenya. Also, as being a tireless champion for vulnerable women, through her extensive travels, she has been able to visit local communities and gain a better understanding of gender issues and poverty. Like Kristen, I'm inspired to build a forum that's able to leverage the role of women and girls worldwide. On behalf of the Millennials Campus Network, please join me in celebrating Kristen Davis, a 2014 Global Generation Awardee. Thank you. That was an awesome job. Here, let's go over here. That was a great job, Stephanie. You're hired. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. I always get very nervous when I have to speak without a script, so please forgive me. They've also given me a clicker, which, you know, we should all be afraid. I'm now going to try, yes, success. I don't think you need to look at my face up there. I really want to talk to you about all of the travels that I've been incredibly lucky to do in my life and all the people that I've met. It's impossible to pick one girl or one woman in my travels because I always meet so many girls and so many women in every village and every area that I've gone to with Oxfam and also just in my private travels and with the elephants. Everyone is always so inspiring. And I want to thank Sam and all of you for being here today because really we need you desperately. That's the truth. I was very lucky to get involved with Oxfam a number of years ago while I was doing Sex in the City, partly because I had been traveling as a tourist and I felt like I really wasn't seeing the truth of what was happening in these communities because people want to give you this kind of beautiful, you know, safari experience, which is, of course, very beautiful. But I wanted to see the truth and I wanted to hear about what was happening. I was very lucky to come across Oxfam, partly in my research after the tsunami, in the thing that really impressed me about them was that they were the only people that I knew of who were completely focused on livelihoods that were sustainable. So they had a five-year plan to stay in the area affected by the tsunami and make sure that all of the farmers and all of the fishermen and everyone in the local communities would be back up on their feet with a sustainable income so that they could leave and that they wouldn't need aid. And I thought, well, that, that's who I want to help. But because I've been successful mostly with shows about women, and I have a huge female fan base because of it, and I consider myself incredibly lucky to have that, I wanted to be focusing on women's issues. And everywhere you go, there are women's issues, whether they're talked about or not. They might be HIV rates. In this particular 
place were visiting the Maasai in Tanzania and the land grab situation had become so intense that these women were without water because people had just taken the land and sold it to farming corporations, land that they had traveled on for generations to water their cattle and get water for their families. So, you know, there's many, many, many different different situations. And the thing about Oxfam that's great is they're saying that their goal is to end extreme poverty and injustice, which really covers a lot. So in my travels, I was incredibly moved and learned so much about so many different things. This is a baby in Haiti. Oxfam had been in Haiti for, I think, 30 years before the earthquake, and they lost 35 people when the earthquake happened. And they were so I mean, just beautiful, beautiful people. And with so much inspiration, this is a young mother here with her daughter. They have moved out of Port-au-Prince into a, a IDP camp that's houses. And when we went to visit them, this young woman had planted this beautiful little garden all around her house. And everything in her house was just so clean. And they have maybe two pots that they've been given, you know. And She's just taken so much pride in it. And that's the kind of thing when you're traveling that you're so moved by. And you think, I want to help these people. I have to do more. I have to do more. So I've been very lucky. This girl is in the um, what's known as the Sean Penn camp. It used to be a golf course. And um, she is so happy to be doing her, her daily run to the, the water truck has arrived. And she's going to go fill that pail with her water. And I just happened upon her and, and walking around the camp. And she grabbed my hand. And that's the kind of warmth and openness that when you're traveling, you know, you look around at the circumstances and you think, how can these people go on? How can these people have hope? But literally, they are filled with hope. They have more hope and more joy than a lot of us do in our so-called, you know, westernized, you know, posh circumstances. There's another little girl there. Here they're learning about washing their hands because cholera had come to Haiti, and so they were learning about that. One of the other things that we would almost always do is we would find women who were finding ways in their local community to create livelihoods for the women in their community. Usually it involved something about good food. So that was a lot of fun. Here I think I'm eating honey and or mangoes. And again, good food. I think that's in um, Mozambique, a girl filled with so much hope. This woman here, and that's her house there, and that's her tent where she's living, which is parked on top of her, her rubble house. She was one of what we call the canteen ladies. And they were within the camps, and they really wanted to work, and they really wanted to be able to help everyone who was in the camps. So Oxfam gave them a stove and a set of pots, and they started cooking warm meals so that the people in the camps could eat good food and be healthy and get their lives back. And then once people were starting to move out of the camps, we helped them set up little shops so that they could have kind of a bodega on the corner and people could come and potentially buy things. The problem being no one had any money to buy things. And that's one of the things about development. When you start to learn about it, you really can become overwhelmed. And today, as I was talking to all of you and hearing about how you're you know, developing your action plans and consequences from your actions and reevaluating it, I was so impressed because you know more than I know, which is a good thing. But what I do know, here I am in Ethiopia. This is a good story. These girls were coming home from school. And this is in a northern region of Ethiopia that's very, very mountainous and beautiful and pretty dry, except for where we've done some irrigation, which you can see behind us. And the women here, um, there had been a number of women who were kind of uh, pushed out of their village because they didn't have um, a husband. Their husbands had run away or died. And so they were kind of on the outskirts. And, our, our team on the ground had, had thought, you know, what could help them? And what could help them was a different kind of goat. So I got a proposal from Oxfam saying, you know, we want to start this goat project. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a new one. This is interesting. Because the goats had been inbred. And so they weren't very healthy. And it was a very, you know, very, very dry season, no rain that year. So if we brought in a new goat, that would be like a new genetic pool for the goats to be stronger, pre produce more milk have more offspring, feed all the children. The funds from selling the goat's milk sent the girls back to school. I happened to be walking down the road and we ran into these girls and this girl got her book out for me and showed me and that book is filled with English. That girl in rural, rural Ethiopia is learning English because her mother received a goat from Oxfam. We might have a picture of a goat. Oh, this woman's making coffee. That was awesome too. Uh, uh, they're the goats, they're the goats. So these goats, 
had gotten into the houses of the widows, basically women who had been, you know, kind of pushed out as not being important. And then they had been so successful that everyone wanted one of these special goats. And so then the women had created a, a business within their own village where they would sell you know, the offspring of the goats to people who wanted them. They became so successful that they started going to the villages around them. And then those women got the goats. And then those women became so successful that they went to the villages around them. And again, it's just the small things. It's something that you might not think would be important, but that's what you're all doing and that's the joy of it all is that you know one tiny thing can lead to so much which brings me to another woman who I find incredibly inspiring Dame Daphne Sheldrick Kenyan married to a man who started the first uh, when Kenya got freedom then they started their national parks she and her husband were in a huge national park and there were all these orphaned animals and no one really knew what to do with them, and a lot of them were elephants, because poaching, this is in the 70s, was still legal. And so Dame Daphne didn't have a degree, was not a vet. She just started taking the elephants in. She wanted to see if she could raise them without their mothers, who had been killed by poachers, and teach them how to live in the wild. She didn't know what she was doing. She just had the passion. She had commitment. She had follow through. She tried and tried and tried and she had many failures. No one knew what to feed a baby elephant. No one knew how to teach them how to pick the right leaves off of a tree to eat to survive. And she's now 80. She has learned by herself how to raise a baby elephant, how to teach it how to be wild and reintroduced into the wild. She's now reintroduced over 200 elephants into the wild. She has raised all of the orphaned elephants that come to her in Kenya, plus zebra, rhinoceros, you name it, she's raised it. And now, because the poaching has started again, and as Stephanie very kindly informed you, every 15 minutes an elephant is being killed, and in 10 years, if we don't stop it, we won't have any elephants in the wild. So it's been my passion lately to try to spread the word and help Daphne and her entire three generations of family try to save the elephants for everyone. I mean, what if we have to turn to our children and say, well, this is what an elephant looked like, kind of like the dinosaurs, you know? I don't want to have to do that. So she's an inspiration to me. These are some of the elephants that I've been able to meet. Yes, that is Nasalot. Whenever I see Nasalot, this is what happens. I think Nasalot wants to read my mind. I always have a really very perfect circle of dirt around my head. These are some of the babies in the nursery. I know, I know, they're amazing, I know. On the right is Saiti, she's much bigger now. She was named after the international board from the UN who monitors wildlife trade. And you know, they're part of the problem but they could also be part of the solution. This is Wendy, she thinks she's human. <laughs> These are our tiny babies, I know, I know, I know. I mean, and these men are the keepers. They spend 24 hours a day with these elephants because the elephants really just want to die from the grief of losing their family. And if someone's not with them 24 hours, they, they relive the grief and they might, they might just not want to live anymore. And this is, this is what Daphne has created and I'm just so honored to be a part of it. And that's Benjamin. He's the head keeper where they go when they're older and you get to see the bigger elephants. Again, the keepers. And that is Lueleni, who I had to work a couple years to befriend, but I have. <laughs> I am so honored that I get to go around the world and see what I see and take part in the things that I take part in and get inspired. And to be able to be here and get an award for it is just uh, really unimaginable to me to be with the people who are here getting awards tonight, but also all of you is incredibly powerful. I just want to say one last thing, and it's that I have a three-year-old daughter, and I love her so much, and it's, you know, very hard to leave her whenever I leave her, because she's three, and she doesn't really understand why I'm leaving. And when I was leaving yesterday, I thought to myself, you know, if there was ever a right time to leave, it's now, because we need the young people. We need you desperately to step up and take action because the world is at a turning point, I feel. There's so many bad things. And the good people have to stand up and we have to fight, and we have to fight really hard. And when I'm here today, I feel the passion from you and I feel the inspiration, and it gives me hope in my heart, so thank you. <laughs>